Welcome to this webinar entitled Building Bridges, the Future of Sustainable Cooperation Between Informal Online Activists and Civil Society Organizations. Following introductions from Civica's Secretary General Ingrid Srinath, Mohammad Ziad Hassan, Senior Planner Social Media from Al Jazeera, presented on the shifting technological parameters of journalism and its role in revolution in the Middle East. We join the webinar just after his presentation has begun. Rahim. Um, Al Jazeera Mubashir exists, his well as sports documentary, his research component, entertaining component. So Al Jazeera in the Middle East has existed for a long time and it's quite uh, effective in the role that he plays in the region. Uh, over the past few months we've seen that uh, the role as Al Jazeera has played has grown not only for this region but being able to tell the stories for, of the region internationally. But one of the things that when I first joined the organization I was proud to learn that it stands by the slogan of being the voice of the voiceless. And I think if we're moving forward and if you're looking at journalism and if you're looking at media and how that is developing, uh, new media tools and social media technologies is allowing, uh, Al Jazeera is allowing new media uh, media organizations, uh, both traditional and non-traditional. Uh, it's allowing activist networks, CM CSOs, NGOs, uh, and the ordinary person on the street to actually have their voices heard and be able to communicate with individuals. Now, how do we begin to deal with this? I think in the past we've been used to it consuming media or understanding our environment or the world we're living in through television. And now more and more that parameters are changing. So we no longer consume media just of TV, yes. but we now consume it of the internet. We can go on websites, we can uh, consume the media yeah. through uh, live blogs, through Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we can watch movies on demand through Netflix. Uh, if we miss a program, we can always catch it online. So we, uh, media, news, information is no longer being fed to us, but we now uh, at the forefront of what we consume. Uh, this was quite a nice little um, cartoon that I found that really gives a great idea um, about what's actually happening in the world where most young people don't actually see news uh, through TV. A lot of the media is sent through them via uh, social networks. And I think that the power that social networks have, looking mainly at Facebook and Twitter, is you're consuming media without realizing it. And a lot of people will face, uh, post an article or link about something that has happened and you click on it. So you're passively uh, consuming information without even realizing it. And what happens is because in social networks you generally are um, friends with people or follow people that you trust whose information you are consuming. And these trusted social networks actually have a tremendous effect. Uh, and we've seen that in Egypt and Tunisia where the mobilization had taken place uh, through meetings, through communication but a large part of it did take place online. I wouldn't go so far as to say that this was a social media revolution or Twitter revolution or Facebook revolution, not at all. But I think that these tools played a fundamental effect in mobilizing uh, individuals to partake in the protests. Um, I've mentioned that there is a new ecosystem that has developed and this is a news ecosystem. Uh, from this we see that as we're consuming media in new ways, we're sharing uh, we're sharing content, we're involved in discourse with people that we know, with people that we trust. Uh, but what we shouldn't forget is not everybody on Facebook and Twitter. I think in most countries it is still the elite of society that are online. I think the first world, the, the developed world, or traditionally known as the first world, uh, are much more connected than those living in the developing world or the third world. Um, parts of Africa, Asia, South America are uh, not part of this discussion. So we should always forget that. It, it is a unique understanding into what's happening in society. It's a virtual space where we can partake in discussions, but by, by, by no means should we assume that this is a uh, popular opinion of everybody. Now, going through the next slide, there's a participatory culture that exists. Um, one of the things that Al Jazeera has done in, in order to be the voice of the voiceless is create ways and means in which different communication or different information being fed to us can be used and then sent out as well. Uh, during the revolution in Tunisia, Al Jazeera Arabic were one of the few um, international news organizations to follow the story from the beginning to see what was happening. And then when Egypt, uh, 25th of January, when the protesters were in Tahrir Square in Cairo, um, a lot of the international media uh, flocked to it and it, it became a global story. I think subsequent uh, events in the Middle East, such as Libya, Syria, has been less in the mainstream media. But I think most people can identify with Egypt because growing up we all learned about the pyramids or we could associate with, um, with the country, we could associate with the struggle. 
uh, geopolitically, Egypt uh, plays a very strong part in, the, in Africa and in the Middle East. Uh, it plays a critical role in the peace talks between the U.S., uh, between the U.S., Palestine, and Israel. So it is a strategic, um, a strategic state. But the unique thing with Egypt was the bloggers, the activists, they were the ones tweeting the information. You could follow these individuals. You could follow Allah. You could follow Nasser. You could follow Wail Ghanim. You could just share their thoughts. You could see what they're saying. It became extremely individualized. And the beauty of this was people throughout the region started or in fact, people throughout the world starting to follow these discussions, see what's happening, uh, looking what their plans were for the next day, and it really did capture the attention of the world. Uh, the media that was being sent out was through Facebook, through Twitter, YouTube. It was sent primarily through social networks. And I think it then, then transformed itself into going onto the TV screen for traditional media. Um, when Egypt, when, the, when <coughs> Egypt, Niger, Libya, when the screens were shut off and you couldn't see anything, no media came out of the country. I think most news organizations were starved of information. Uh, the advantage was you still could get information from the ground once the internet turned back on. Um, what Al Jazeera did is we communicated to people via Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, the Scribble Lives blog was developed and uh, we had people live blogging as events took place uh, with, uh, on the ground. Uh, through audio boo, when the internet was down, we, had, we were calling people up in Dakar Square uh, getting their opinions about what's happening and then uploading it onto the website. Uh, Twitter developed speak to tweet. So the idea was you could you call into a number, speak for like a minute, and that would then show up on Twitter. So even though there was no internet, there still were ways to get a message out. And I think at that point in time, everybody were looking to see what was happening in Egypt and through this new form of technology, we could... We could, we could Sorry, Mohammed. Sorry, can I just interrupt? People are having a little bit trouble hearing you, so I'm just wondering if you can try to speak a bit louder. Um, it might make it a little bit easier. The scene is quite quiet. Sure, will do. Okay, sorry about that. No, not a problem. I apologize about that. Um, Al Jazeera has a website called Sharik. Sharik is basically a user-generated platform on the Al Jazeera Arabic channel where any, anybody can go and upload a video. Uh, on Sharek, at the point of the revolution and at the high, highest point, we were receiving anything between 1,000 to 3,000 videos, photos being uploaded directly from uh, Tahrir Square, directly from Misrata, directly from all the different areas in the region. Currently, every, every Friday, there are protests throughout the, throughout the region in the Arab world, and we have specific people going through that content, filtering it and verifying it, just to have a look at the, at the information. The English channel's equivalents, uh, yourmedia.aljazeera.net, is less effective in this regard because a lot of the things currently happening in the Arab world is based primarily in Arabic. So people are able to then forward the information uh, to, to the language that they do speak. <coughs> so with, with, with Sharek, we found that even though our cameras and our crew weren't allowed in Libya when the events just occurred, through Sharek we could still get the information <coughs> coming out. And this was being sent directly from citizen journalists, bloggers, ordinary people in the street who were able to assist uh, traditional media and in fact were able to get their message out what was happening. The problem that you get with social media is that a lot of it becomes noise. If you currently look now on Twitter what's trending, uh, it would be about Rebecca Black or Justin Bieber. Uh, fortunately, this past few days it has been about uh, Rupert Murdoch and what about the parliamentary um, hearings into the phone hacking. So very rarely do we see that current news events are actually trending on uh, the social media, media platforms globally. But in order to assess uh, social media content, it's the information minus the noise plus understanding the context, understanding the context and then you have a better understanding of, of what the reporting is, of what's actually taking place. Uh, what we found at Al Jazeera, one of the biggest problems was verification. If somebody sends you a video from Misrata, uh, a lot of fact checking needs to be done. Are they from Misrata? Are they uploading a video? Did it actually occur? There's an entire uh, list of verification techniques and tools that we've developed and we've begun training in the newsroom, uh, both in Al Jazeera English and Arabic is with the, with the staff in the website, TV and programs, for them to all better understand what is this content being sent to us, how do we verify it before it actually goes out the news in order to have accurate reporting. Uh, during, during the revolution, uh, this young lady, Asma Mahfouz, uh, recorded a video message and uploaded it on Facebook. 
uh, sorry, uploaded it on Facebook, which was then uploaded on YouTube. This video exists, uh, I think, about in 50 different channels on Facebook uh, uh, and YouTube as well. It received uh, hundreds, of, hundreds of thousands of hits. Uh, it's, it's about Asma speaking to people, telling them that they ask, she is scared about what's happening in Egypt, and she is scared to go out in the streets, but she still will go out into the street on the 25th of January to protest, just to create awareness about what's happening. So here we see that a young, a young girl took it upon herself, uh, had a very emotional message, and people were able to, to hear this message just using social media. And I think this is a great testament to see the effect that social media is having um, with regards to getting uh, messages out. Uh, the method that Al Jazeera chose was uh, during the Arab uprisings, you had traditional TV. So you had information coming up on Al Jazeera English TV channel. But then we had the live blog as well. So if you went to uh, the website, every few seconds or few minutes, the live blog was being updated about what's happening. Uh, currently, Al Jazeera has live blogs about uh, some of the events happening in Sudan, but as well as Libya as well. Uh, the live streaming could be found on the Al Jazeera website as well. Live streaming was on Facebook, live streaming was on YouTube. So now, in order to follow what was happening with uh, the revolution, you, did, you no longer had to just rely on, uh, on watching TV. You could now consume media, you could find out what's happening online. And I think this has become a growing trend uh, for quite a period now where people are actually looking at other platforms to, to consume media. Um, Twitter itself plays a huge role in micro-reporting. Uh, little, small, 140 characters can tell a narrative once they all put together. So through the Al Jazeera English Live blog, uh, there was constant updates being sent about the events happening. Uh, we look at like the picture of Ayman Mohideen. For, 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 for Cairo, it was easier to identify the people in the street so you, so you could understand what was happening. In Libya, for instance, a lot of the information coming out of Libya uh, through Twitter, they were coming out under pseudonyms or under Libya voices or Lib Libya youth. I think individuals there, there is still a certain fear of putting their, their real name and information out uh, due to fear of crackdown by the authorities. So we saw a very different situation happen in Egypt compared to Libya. And I think that's why Egypt uh, remains um, much more active in what's happening. I think. Uh, bulk of the international media and the international community understand less of the politics of Libya and it's more difficult to identify with people. Um, if, if we're looking at social media, if we're looking at how do we use these tools, how do we use these technologies for social good, I think the most important thing is to begin building communities. Uh, whether it's on different social network platforms, it's important to understand who the audience are, build these communities and see what, um, what is needed. Uh, currently at Al Jazeera, we're looking at projects like Sharek in different languages, as well as we're in the process of currently uh, developing a project where we'll be able to get videos from uh, citizen journalists throughout the world, um, articulating concerns, grievances, interviewing people, highlighting and raising key issues. And I think uh, a platform like this is important because you're actually giving, uh, you're giving people the ability to discuss what's happening in the communities. Um, the issues facing citizen journalism is that most people uh, don't really hold the high journalistic standards that journalists would hold. But I think in light of recent events, I think journalists aren't holding those uh, standards. But that's another discussion completely. Um, the issue with citizen journalists is sometimes you can't always verify what information they're sending in. And I think the verification <coughs> process is extremely important. Um, but then we also have the, the, between individuals and existing groups. Uh, so the issue of online activism versus offline action is quite important. Uh, we've seen in the past that a lot of online activism, activism has taken place, but if it just remains online, uh, there is no real development, nothing really comes, comes of it. Uh, with existing groups, NGOs, CSOs, and uh, blogger and ne uh, activist networks, we've seen that these online discussions have taken place and it has manifested itself into thousands of people coming to a place like Tahrir Square to protest. So I think going forward, it's important for us to look at how do, how do we engage online and how does that translate to uh, offline action and how do we ensure that we don't take the discussions away from where they're happening. Uh, the idea to live stream um, what was happening in Egypt on all the different pl platforms that Al Jazeera is currently present, uh, present is important. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, now Google+, YouTube, 
uh, discussions exist amongst different peoples, among different communities. It's important to keep those discussions in with those communities on that platform. Um, like Al Jazeera isn't looking to get those discussions and move them to the website because uh, the beauty of it is nobody owns the internet, nobody owns the discussions. These are completely organic discussions that are rising within different social networks and different communities online. Uh, one of the things that Al Jazeera currently prides itself is that telling the truth is hard and not telling the truth is even harder. Uh, and sometimes I think with individuals, we have act individuals have access uh, to greater areas, greater stories and greater problems that most uh, NGOs or that most um, global media organizations don't have. So I think there should be a strong emphasis in training um, young people in how to, how to articulate the message, how to articulate the story, how do you go about uh, creating awareness. And even if this is just on Twitter with 140 characters at a time, over a period of, over a period of time and after 10 tweets, it begins to tell a very powerful narrative. Thank you. Sorry, guys. Um, Ingrid, I'm just going to pass it back over to you. And if I can't seem to unmute you for some reason. Um, sorry, guys. Ingrid seems to have um, not be able to reach her just at the moment. I think there might be some internet issues um, at her her desk. Um, we also are having trouble connecting the next presenter. So. I'm just going to see um, if Soren, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Are you able to do your presentation now? Yes, I'll be happy to do it now. Okay, great. Then I'll just pass right over to you. Um, but you have can... loaded it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I can open it here on my computer. So just one second, I will load it for you. Sorry, guys, about this. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so. Okay, sorry, and they should be able to see your presentation now. Okay. okay. Go ahead. Great. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks so much, first of all, for having me and to participate in this fast. Uh, hello. Can you hear me? Sorry, sorry. They should be able to hear you. Oh, okay. But will you run the presentation for me? Or? Yeah, I will. Okay. Great. All right. So terrific. So um, first of all, thank you for having. Having me here, I work for the innovation practice, so you might have questions who we are. So basically, we have been really inspired by all of the uh, great changes in the use of crowdsourcing, innovations, and social media, and open street maps uh, without, by, of course, from outside <laughs> the World Bank. And our main role is really to bring some of those innovations within the international donor community. So um, that's why now here I talk about the open development through innovations in the use of information communication technology. So something has dramatically changed around us and so how can we kind of uh, use these changes for more long-term to addressing long-term development challenges and improve the living conditions of poor communities. Uh, next, please. Thanks. Sorry. So the new paradigm Sorry. we are trying to implement is basically based. So I really want to start out with this image because uh, to remind us all that um, this is the type of person we really want to reach. So this uh, Aymara woman in rural Bolivia. Uh, she has about three years of education 
she uh, lives at about, I would say, 30 cents a day. And uh, she had so far no access to any basic services. And so this program here um, provided solar panels and electricity to her and her family. So now how can we basically apply uh, online activism, ICTs, and so forth to improve some of the uh, openness, this accountability, the governance and transparency of development programs. Because so far, so many programs have failed to reach a person like her. Uh, next, please. So this new paradigm we are working on is really based on accountability. So we uh, promote uh, enhanced transparency of donors, more participation, collaboration, and economic empowerment. And how can basically we use uh, these uh, new tools and processes and communities, of course, to promote change? Next, please. So now, um, well, this is just uh, the president of the World Bank has laid out this vision that basically we could make development much more open. And this is the launch of the Open Data Initiative, Open Knowledge. And basically, the idea is that people on the ground, a local person, could access development knowledge and data and just uh, improve their uh, living condition, not just receive information or data, but what is much more powerful, uh, the crowd voicing. So basically, have directly people provide comments and make their voices heard in the development process. Next, please. So this is just shows a little bit the paradigm shift from basically a closed system. So on the left side you see more the traditional approach many donors uh, have been taken and now we try to see how this new network approach towards an open, much more open process, which uh, can be not done by one institution at all, but by many. So it needs a collaborative approach, a community uh, connecting, facilitation, and uh, it's a lateral instead of a linear approach, and the people are co-creators and communities instead of passive recipients or beneficiaries of development programs. So now uh, what uh, actually many of you have been directly involved in is that kind of revolution issue is going on uh, outside of donors. And so it has to do with it. We believe strongly there is this potential game-changing opportunities for de development, which is related to the rapid spread of mobile technology, second, uh, the broad use of social media, and the third uh, is the idea of G of mapping, say I mentioned briefly open street maps, so basically geocoding or geo-enabling uh, development programs. And we are just uh, working with different agencies and partners on a new knowledge open development knowledge partnership which tries to work together, which aims to work with together with partners from civil society, governments, donors, and even also the private sector to promote the use of ICTs and social media to enhance social accountability, to use it for anti-corruption uh, programs, governance, and to enhance the, the results of development programs. Next, please. Okay, so here are some of the visions. So first is uh, the open data. So first of all, we thought like it's really important that we make our underlying data much more available open, free of charge, and accessible. So the 
Bank has launched the Open Data Initiative about uh, April of last year. The second, which basically has made 7,000 development indicators uh, available to to everyone. We use second, the open knowledge. So the idea here is that also the underlying uh, data which are being produced to to research or basically together with communities can then be made available together. And the third is the notion of developing uh, some open solutions. And we recently had this what we call the apps for development competition, which basically engaged uh, online activists and developers to develop uh, tools and applications relevant for, for development. So here, as I talked before, this is the Open Data Initiative. So basically, before we uh, launched this, uh, it was very cumbersome to access uh, data. You needed a subscription to the data. Now it's easy, free access, 7,000 indicators. We partnered with Google, Microsoft, others to basically make that available online much easier on this data.worldbank.site, but particularly also to search engines like Google, Bing, and or Yahoo. So, uh, and what is really important I wanted to emphasize is that this is really a huge uh, culture change within the institution because you have to imagine that people who used to own this, uh, Hans Rosling calls this uh, the database hugging syndrome, so that people would want to keep, you know, own their data uh, on their desktops and don't want to share them openly. But now, basically, this has been has changed, and now all of these indicators, as I mentioned, 7,000, and are now freely available and also accessible through basically formats which is an API or basically easily downloadable downloadable in XML, um, Excel and other formats. And now um, next please. And so basically what we've seen that many uh, so here's what I just described, but many uh, people come to to donors of the World Bank not for um, for projects, but for data and for knowledge. So basically, this is an important aspect of making all that information available. And then we we are convinced, and we have seen this in the past, that this can leverage institutions, uh, leverage innovations, excuse me, from outside the bank and enable new collaborations we've never seen before. And that happened through the Apps for Development Challenges, which was a global competition and involved like hundreds of uh, developers from Africa, Latin America, Asia, Europe, and, and North America. And um, has basically enabled us to have a much more direct contact with, with this community, with the online community than, than we ever had before. Just for a factor like now, this open data site has 30% more traffic than the World Bank's homepage. So it's right now the most visited uh, website uh, of, of the World Bank. Next, please. But now, um, so here's just the example that you can access the information much easier through uh, search engines. Um, and you get this one box uh, in Google, which actually shows you the indicator directly, but not just that. And now we come to the power of visualizations, and uh, so we are convinced that it's not only making information more publicly available. Second, they have to be accessible, and third, very important, uh, should be visualizations. And there we come to the the power of visualization tools and uh, interactive mapping. So if we come next, please. So what are we doing now concretely? So these are examples, um, maybe you're all familiar with the Map Kibera program in, uh, in Kenya. What is basically very powerful here is that youth 
decided to map their own communities. And as you see here on, on the map, basically previously uh, this biggest uh, slum in Africa used to be mapped as a forest. So the government did not acknowledge the existence of, of that uh, slum. And now through crowdsourcing, youth are mapping their own communities, their schools, their health posts, and so forth. And that uh, process is now a very powerful tool in order to open up that development process. In fact, so we just have the government of Kenya has just launched 10 days ago. We were actually supporting this, uh, the Open Data Initiative of Kenya, which has, done, which has for the first time ever made public expenditure data, meaning what funding flows where to which communities in which sectors available online, and has also uh, made the census data available and showed basically, and we have mapped them where the different voting programs are. So it's all an effort to enhance the transparency and accountability mechanisms of government and donors. Uh, but these, uh, it's all basically uh, a reaction, if you wish, um, promoted by groups like Ushahidi and others uh, within Kenya. We work closely with them. So next, please. So this is the case of uh, Ushahidi and disaster crisis mapping. So disaster relief has changed forever. And here, actually, the World Bank, for the first time, why is it significant? Because online communities here have directly made a huge difference in changing the behavior of donors. So when the earthquake struck, uh, the, the State Department and the World Bank and others did, ha did not have a good map of port au -Prince. So we did not know where all the infrastructure, where the schools are, where the hospitals are. So basically within, I think, our for the last 48 hours, the OpenStreetMap community with Ushahidi and Tuft, particularly many students, have basically built the first map. And what is different this time is that for the first time, this crowdsourced data was accepted and actively used by the World Bank in our disaster response. So we've done the first so-called virtual disaster assessment where three terabytes of data were uh, were basically distributed by a, by a group of 3,000 volunteers. The group is called the Random Hacks of Kindness. And then uh, all of this data was, in fact, used to respond to, to, the, to the disaster. Uh, next, please. So now, uh, the, and here what you see is what we'd like to promote and starting to work on in several programs in, for instance, in uh, Congo DRC or in the DR, in the uh, Dominican Republic, excuse me, in Brazil, in uh, Nepal, is the, I, is the notion that citizens themselves can start providing feedback via SMS to uh, donors and governments on whether or not those services, for instance here this shelter or school is being built or not. So basically we are starting to explore how we can use the power of SMS and um, cell phones and particularly and mapping to strengthen existing social accountability mechanisms such as citizen scorecards or participatory budgeting. And we are just uh, starting these programs uh, uh, in several, several activities. Actually, in, in the middle, in Egypt, we work now closely with a group called ANSA, the Associate Network for Social Accountability, a regional program. And uh, it's uh, with CARE. We work together with CARE Egypt, and which will be launched now late in the fall. Uh, next, please. So here are some examples of projects we already use that. So uh, in India, for instance, we use uh, mobile phones and 
itself and the digital cameras to track better the services provided to mid by midwives to uh, to women. And then the example I just gave was the solar power in rural Bolivia. Because here the main question is really whether or not those services uh, reach the most remote and most vulnerable uh, people. The last example is in Cambodia. So there, one of our program managers has championed this. Basically, they have geocode, they have, uh, the entire national highway system of Cambodia was digitized and then was uh, filmed, was basically produced a video of the situation of the roads. And that was that data, this geocoded data, was then put on Google Earth. And uh, it was very apparent which parts of the roads basically um, were built and which not. And there was a major effort to basically support transparency and openness of that program because every citizen could then look up that system and see which parts of the world system the funding came from. Next, next please. So now uh, here's the example from, um, from Kenya again. So Huduma, which is .NET, is basically a system which allows citizens' voices via cell phones, SMS, to be visualized on these dashboards and interactive mapping. And what uh, now we have worked on together with activists and uh, CSOs is to basically uh, launch this, and the government of Kenya, this open uh, open data initiative, which is using for the first time these tools uh, and the government, what is very important now is just starting to use those tools for their own planning and own better targeting of aid. So the aid transparency problem is very important. So we work closely also with IATI, International Aid Transparency Initiative. So the whole notion here is that aid flows like this, the NGO in London called Publish What You Fund. So we are very much convinced that we should do a much better job in publishing what we fund, making it openly available to anybody in the world to see where the resource is used by international donors uh, are flowing. I'll go to the next, please. So this Tavez uh, Daraj is an example which is really struck, uh, was very powerful inside the donor institution now. So this shows water point mapping. So the biggest issue we face actually is that many of our development like infrastructure projects, for instance the construction of wells, is the maintenance of these wells. So the fact of we found out, or Tavesa with the Raja found out that more than 50% of the wells, or a large percentage of those wells, which were built um, by the government, did not function anymore. So bottom line is whether these water points actually work or not. And so here now, we are also working on a pilot in Liberia with the ministry where we basically use crowdsourcing approach to empower citizens to provide direct feedback on whether the services they're supposed to get actually work or not. And that's where we would like to move more in, in the future. But I have to really say this is a very modest um, and early pilot at this, at this moment. And it's really inspired by the work of communities uh, and people like you, and we are just learning from these experiences and are trying to implement them or apply them within our work. Next, please. So this is now the flow. This is the application Tanzania. It's one of those programs where the World Bank now is trying to use the same approach. Uh, next, please. So 
this is the example of text eagle where basically uh, there the difference is which I think is is also very important that poor people who provide data and answer SMS and surveys in return are getting uh, compensation. So in poor there is cash basically they get uh, in their cell phones per answered survey they get maybe something like 20 cents of cash delivered into their phones. It's only enabled in Kenya for Mbessa. Next please. So now here is a, an initiative we are not championing. So we applied the same with Shahidi crowdsourcing approach. In a way we work together with a community of students and universities around the world and are now um, basically putting development on the map. So here what we've done is within uh, eight weeks last year, we were able to geocode all of the World Bank's programs in the Africa region and Latin America region and could show this for the first time ever, the exact location of our education or health programs, for instance. Here what you see is the Africa map. and pull all of this data out of those documents which you see on top, which basically are not easily understandable, accessible, because those per project you have to read about a document of 100 to 120 pages. And so now uh, making that uh, data much more accessible and to visualizations, we hope that uh, many more people can access that data and also what is actually completely new is to know that geography matters. So I've written a blog called Geography and Aid. So it's basically the question is where, for instance, the last uh, on the bottom you see Tanzania. So what you see here is infant mortality rates. So the very dark, um, these are at the local level, community level, subnational. So in the south of Tanzania, you see this very dark red. And in the north, you see uh, you see it much like almost white or or pink colored. So what that means is that in southern Tanzania, twice about 15 percent of children die in their first year, and in the north, it's about seven percent. So now, uh, if that's a situation of people's living conditions and their well-being then the question of course, of course arises, where, do the, where does the World Bank target its programs? And here you see the blue dots are our investments in health. And so that of course then caused a lot of debate internally and externally as well, a questioning and a more analytical tool showing how do we respond and whether or not we target the most marginalized communities in each country. Uh, next, please. Sorry, so, if I could just chip in, chip in for a little bit. I've noticed you've got almost 11 slides left. Uh, do you want to sort of go through them just a bit quicker? Yeah, I'll be quick. So this is uh, the main objective is results, openness, and accountability uh, of these programs and using uh, mapping and interactive tools. Next, please. So here's this program in uh, Bolivia. So you see to the left, uh, you see basically the poverty map of Bolivia. And in the center, these very dark areas uh, the, at the community level, you see basically there 96% 96, 96 of people live under a dollar a day. So extreme level of poverty towards the west or the center of the country, whereby in the east, uh, there is the Amazon area, there you have basically a more a economic boom around the city of Santa Cruz. And so these show basically very important regional inequalities within countries. And to the bottom right you see now this second map shows you the dark area to the right and uh, the yellow to the, to, to the west is basically where the World Bank's investment was targeted. And so now this is exactly the question I just raised. 
how can we use these type of tools. Also, particularly, this was used by the government of Bolivia to develop their first national development program. So this is the question. Oh, hello? Something happened. Hello, hello? Okay. We can hear you, sorry, and go ahead. Yes, I just lost the screen. Um, okay, so basically, uh, this is the question which came up. Also, improved planning. So how do you do better targeting of AIDS? So what you see here quickly is the, the schools. So the very dark red area is the number of children out of school. And the blue dots are the, the schools funded by the program. So now the question in the top right, you see this error. Basically, the question is why are there such a large number of children out of school and no schools are being built in this area? So you can use this uh, for better planning. Next, please. The next is to do better project uh, supervision implementation. So one of our partners in the Philippines called checkmyschool.org .org basically enables students and uh, parents to directly send SMS messages to the, to the Ministry of Education uh, if uh, teachers don't show up to class or if textbooks don't arrive. So here's really the idea so that citizens can check the quality of education and have that feedback loop empowering them to basically make their voices heard towards the government. And there our role was mostly facilitators, actually a civil society organization, but what is very important that then the government is also using that data and that you need to facilitate this dialogue between civil society and online activists and governments actually to make governments more accountable and responsive to citizens' needs. Next, please. So this, this, I think, should already explained. We can skip this. Next, please. So this is the tracking of results. Here again, this is this program in Bolivia. So the basic issue was how do you ensure whether these 18, the project intended, the objective was to provide 18,000 of these solar systems to families. And now, how do you monitor whether or not these services are in fact delivered to extremely remote areas? And here, this project has used GPS and mapping and these digital images for each system which was installed to show that uh, this was done or not. And it's very powerful because then the government could find out that indeed only about 12,000, well, 10, I think 10,000 systems were installed instead of 18,000. And that helped to improve then really that uh, more people got that, uh, that solar panel project. Next, please. So now the Open Aid Partnership is a program we launched together with uh, Sweden. So here the government of Sweden with the US, uh, Korea, uh, Germany is interested in the UK. So here's the notion that we, it's very simple that we would a common platform where you could look up, say, Malawi and see all donor activities mapped. So in Malawi, you have 26 donors active, very small country, extreme poverty, and a lot of uh, overlap of donors. And so the question is how do you use these tools to better support countries to uh, better manage and harmonize and uh, coordinate aid. And then very important to enable citizens to provide direct feedback on the program. Next, please. So key objective to visualize this, to better impact on people, to improve aid effectiveness, enhance transparency, and enable citizens and other stakeholders, uh, citizens and civil society to really uh, provide direct feedback on the results of those donor-funded programs. Next, please.
So here you see it applied to the different levels, uh, to the continent, one country in Tanzania, at the local level, and at the project level. So these new uh, crowdsourcing, interactive mapping, and mobiles can be used at different levels of intervention, macro, meso, and micro local community, whereby we are most excited actually uh, at local open data, like the example to the left, where you, to the bottom left, where you see local schools and local school enrollment. Next, please. So that's uh, one of the last, basically, aid effect. And what you see here is now applied already. So we worked with the African Development Bank. And in the back, the very dark, see the poverty rate in Mozambique. So it's very, very, uh, well, first of all, a lot of poverty in many regions, but then also a lot of regional inequalities, and you see the clustering of aid. So the African Development Bank and World Bank work sometimes in very similar regions. Next, I think there's one more slide. Yeah, okay, this is the example in Kenya, and here I think it's even more visible, like clear, so we have again the back on the poverty map, and so this is the start of our open aid partnership, where basically you analyze these kind of tools to see the concentration of aid flows in certain regions, so in Nairobi, Nyanza to the west, western Kenya, and Mombasa, and so now uh, we are working with different, with IATI and different donors in order to make aid flows more transparent and accountable. And uh, we would very much like to be in touch with you to see how these tools can then, uh, how civil society actors can proactively use this information. Because the last aspect I want to mention, what all of this is really crucial is the capabilities. So the capacity of citizens to actually use this data, to use social media and these new tools in order to build, uh, to strengthen accountability mechanisms. I thank you very much. Thank you, Soren. Uh, that was as data rich a presentation as I've ever seen. Um, I know we're having difficulty getting a good audio connection to Amanda, so I'm going to request Berg Hildur if you're on already, maybe you want to go next. Uh, hello, do you hear me? We do, yes. Hello. Yes, yes we hello. hear you. My name is Berkil. Yes, hello. Uh, nice. we're, we're ready to go up next if, if you have our slides available, yeah? While we're loading their coolest, they should be there now. Um, a couple of questions that are coming in. One. Okay, are they coming now? Go ahead, Berkholder. Okay. Um, Go we, ahead. Do we not see the slides on the screen? Oh, it should be. Sorry, one second. <laughs> okay. It should be there. Is it there now? I still have the last. Okay, time. one sec. <laughs> Okay, I'm just going to use the time uh, while you're doing this and present myself. My name is Berkil Dretla Bertnasdóttir and I'm the press officer by the Constitutional Council of Iceland and here is also Finnur Magnusson, the technical officer of Constitutional Council. And we are going to talk about uh, the work here and the story about all this and also the transparency and crowdsourcing. So if we can just start uh, the PowerPoint. So yes, you should be able to see it now. Um, that it. Is it okay for everyone else? Can you give us the presentation right so that we can run it? Yeah, I'm doing that right now. <laughs> okay. Um, We are currently broadcasting our 17, uh, 17th meeting of the Constitutional Council uh, live on our website, uh, so there is so much to do here. 
But there's some problem still with the presentation. Okay, do you, are you guys showing it on your computer? Sorry, I'm not sure I'm following. We, we can do that if you want. It might just be easier. I'll just pass it, the screen to okay. you guys then, because for some reason okay. you're not. Yes. Uh, so my screen. Let me know when you see it. See it. Good. Okay. I just have to press play, and we're good. Okay. Are we not? See. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Uh, it's not showing. Yet. Okay. You you see it right now. Hello. We're seeing your desktop, so we're also seeing, you know, we're seeing this window as well as other windows. Okay. okay. Yeah, let me see. Technical glitch here. Oh, great. Seems like the software isn't behaving. I can pass you back to so you can see it on my screen if that's going to be easier. And then I'll give you guys mouse control and hopefully that will work. Okay. okay Sorry. I've lost control of mine. There you go. It's better. Yeah, so you guys should be able to control the mouse as well, and so just go through the pages. But if you need me to do it, let me know. Okay. Well, if you see it, uh, the presentation right now, the first page. Just flick to the next one, please, if you can. Okay, we are going to start, talk uh, at the uh, the beginning about the prologue to all this. Uh, but on 16th of June 2010, 10, the Act on Constitutional Assembly was approved by Althingi, which is the parliament here in Iceland. And it said that the special constitutional assembly should be a gathering for the purpose of uh, revising the constitution of the Republic of Iceland and it should be composed of 25 delegates. Uh, the act are also stated that the national forum of approximately 1,000 people should be held well in advance of the election to the Constitutional Assembly. Uh, and you can click to the next. Should I do that? Uh, the next, yes. Uh, the Act also said uh, that uh, um, a special constitutional committee should be appointed. The committee had the role of preparing and organizing the uh, aforementioned National Forum on Constitutional Matters. The committee should also undertake the collection and processing of available material and information relating to constitutional matters, which could be useful to the Constitutional Assembly. Furthermore, it should uh, present ideas on amendments to the Constitution when the Assembly convenes. And if you go to the next one, please. Next. Yes, uh, then on 6th of November 2010, uh, the National Forum was held and the people there were selected randomly. There were 950 uh, that uh, was uh, uh, in this uh, meeting. And the forum called for the principal viewpoints and points of emphasis of the Icelandic people concerning the organization of the country's governance and its, uh, uh, and its constitution. It was, uh, as we can describe in one word, it was a bit of a crowdsourcing. And you can see its conclusion in English on this website that you see there uh, on this slide. So next, please. No, yes, this one. Um, the election to the Constitutional Assembly took place on 27 of November 2010. 
and there were uh, surprisingly many people that filed to run in this election, or 522 persons. And it, uh, the, but there were 25 delegates that were uh, elected. And th this is the picture of, from, the, from the council and, and some of the members. So please have the next one. But then there came a, a little problem. Uh, there were three complaints uh, were re received by the Icelandic Supreme Court about the election to the Constitutional Assembly. Oral proceedings on uh, the complaints were made in January 2011. And two weeks later, the Supreme Court determined to invalidate uh, the election. The court ruled that several issues could not could have made the vote flawed, such as using non-traditional ballot boxes, and the ballot paper was marked with a series of number that could make them traceable. But there were no known, known uh, cases that th this was, in fact, uh, that this in fact happened. And our el election system is very strict here in Iceland. So uh, the next, please. The next, yes. Uh, and now we come to uh, our Constitutional Council. Uh, after this decision of the Supreme Court, a special parliamentary committee was appointed to suggest a solution concerning the Constitutional Assembly. The majority of the committee proposed that an advisory Constitutional Council should be appointed by Althingi, the Parliament, to, re to revise the Constitution and the members of the Council should be the same as were elected in the, in the election to the Constitutional Assembly. Uh, I think he approved this and, uh, on 24th of March 2011. And the next, please. Uh, so the first meeting of the Constitutional Council was uh, held on 6th of April 2011. It is composed of 25 delegates, as I mentioned before, 15 men and 10 women, and they shall deliver the Council's proposition about the Constitution to the Althingi, uh, the Parliament, uh, by the end of July, or actually 29th of July. Uh, next, please. Uh, they, uh, the, the Council, of, of course, started to uh, do a working process. It made its own work procedure. The members divided themselves into three committees. Each committee has its set of issues. For example, Committee A discusses human rights, religion, and, and, and the env environment, and so on. And the committee uses uh, the report from the Constitutional Committee that I mentioned it before. Uh, and they also uh, decided at the beginning to be very transparent in all its work. Uh, I'm just going to talk a little bit about it before we talk about the transparency here. We have open meeting uh, weekly where the committees submit uh, their propositions. All propositions are, are in the document, uh, the constitutional draft on our website. The constitutional draft is a preparation for the field and the public can comment on each uh, proposition. So now I'm going to, going to give uh, Finnur Magnusson uh, the word, and he's going to talk uh, more about the transparency, the crowdsourcing, and so on. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so I, I'm in charge for the technical side, and as you see from this presentation, <laughs> uh, we, we, have, we have the occasional problems. Uh, but uh, the, the, the task we had before us was that we, it, it's just me and one other person. In Iceland, we are 300,000 people, and we were tasked, we got three months to build uh, all the infrastructure, you know, everything from building desks into providing uh, computers, a website, and fulfill this need for full transparency. Basically, the, the 25 delegates were very clear in their proceedings that they wanted to keep this process as open and transparent as possible. Uh, it meant that, as, as you can imagine, you can't go to the store and pick up a, a software solution to write a constitution. We had to build a lot of things ourselves, but we straight off we, we took uh, the stance to use as much of open and free solutions and 
using social media applications that are freely available uh, to our benefit. So, uh, like in that case, we are the first government agency to use Google Docs, and we're using Dropbox and Flickr and Twitter and YouTube and all those things to broadcast our material. If you flip to the next slide, please, I can try to try to explain all of the pieces of the puzzle. So, like Bedkater was describing. Uh, we have these weekly council meetings, and I think one of the uh, revolutionary things uh, our constitution council decided to do was to use something called like an, an agile methodology. This is something perhaps known better from software uh, industry, where you, you you do the process in small iterations, and after each iteration, you publish and get feedback for what you've done. This is very different from other uh, government uh, processes that we have here in Iceland where committees usually are closed up in a dark room for three or four months and then they uh, publish their results. Instead, we split the, the 25 delegates into three committees. They worked on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, created their proposals, and these were published on our website and discussed in an open streaming uh, webcast and we have one currently going on, that's why I'm a bit stressed, <laughs> but uh, this was released to the public and one of the things that they decided to do was to have it completely open for comments uh, from the public. So we used uh, the Facebook connection. It's not a very well-known fact, but we, we do have a very high penetration of, of broadband connectivity here in Iceland. And we are somewhere in between 70 and 80 percent of, of people on the voting age that, that do have access and are using Facebook actively. So uh, Facebook recently updated their technology so that you can sign in using other email addresses and such. And given that we had a week to implement it and we didn't have any budget, this was the, the path we chose. And it has worked very well. We, we do have open comments and we do we are very active on our own Facebook page as well. But uh, last time I checked, we've got around 3,500 comments from people, mainly Icelanders, of course, because our site and the proposals are in Icelandic. So 3,500 comments on the, the formal letters, the, the draft chapters, and all of those things. And as I said, this has been iterated again and again and has been a very open process throughout. And I have to uh, I mention that we are 320,000 people that live in Iceland. Yes, that's not very well known fact. Uh, we switch to the next one, please. So, as I mentioned, we, we do have a lot of open channels, and one of those channels is through formal letters. and. This, uh, we, we have received 376 formal letters, and both, both the comments and these letters, they have uh, made an impact on our work. Basically, uh, a couple of letters have gone through the, the committee uh, process all the way through to the, the weekly meetings and have made a direct impact on the constitution draft we're discussing today. Uh, next, please. Oh, you skipped my favorite one. Can you go on back? Like I mentioned, we, we did this as an iterative process, and this photo might not say a lot without explanation, but the column on the far left is our current constitution that we've had since 44, 1944. And then each column is the, the state of the draft document uh, on a weekly basis. So we, we published 10 updates to our document and it was incremented, as you see, lengthwise. In the last three weeks, we were doing amendments and, and changes and updates. And just today, we are discussing kind of the final draft of the bill. We hope to have that all finished by next week. Uh, next one, please. Uh, the constitution uh, in Iceland, it's, it's a bit different with us. Then, then, for instance, if you talk to someone in the United States where the Constitution is it's very well known and, and kind of a publicly discussed thing, we, we do not have a lot of awareness for our, our current Constitution. But, uh, so the, 
to get our word out, we decided to almost be our own press office in a sense. We started out uh, during the national assemblies to, to post photos and videos and updates, explanations on our Facebook page and it has grown steadily uh, and our delegates have actually been very active on the social media channels as well. We do have a, a Twitter feed which is more for kind of presenting information where we're at but when the international media picked up on our story uh, that has been our main kind of English correspondence, uh, you know, answering questions and things through Twitter. We have had over 8,000 views on our YouTube page. Uh, this is where we regularly post three to five minute clips about our, our work and where we're at and, you know, try to make this, this rather dry legal text more accessible to the general public. And we post photos to our Flickr page. And that has meant that you know we have this all available under the Creative Commons uh, guidelines. So any media agency can pick up photos and videos and things that we do and, and we use in their coverage. We are at Stuart Lagerald on all these mediums. So Facebook.com slash Stuart Lagerald, Twitter slash Stuart Lagerald, YouTube Stuart Lagerald, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, next one, please. Lessons. Uh, lesson number one. Uh, if you go to the next one, there were a lot of people uh, that were worried about this <laughs> type of transparency. Uh, what will happen when we turn the facet? This has ne never been done for government agency in Iceland, and, and a lot of the things that we're doing is highly controversial. But our number one lesson is that no one got hurt. Uh, it has been a thoroughly enjoyable process throughout. Uh, next one. One back. Like I mentioned before, uh, on the previous slide, it doesn't matter. Like I mentioned before, is that the comments, the discussion, and the formal letters we received have, have actually made an impact on the final document. So it, it has really been a, a good addition to the, the committee process. Uh, but as you might imagine, the, the Constitution is a, is a fairly complicated document and, and highly complex legal text in some cases, even though we've been doing our best to, to keep it as approachable as, as possible. Um, and I would say out of our 300 and some thousand uh, people here in Iceland, we have a very active group of around 300 people that have really participated throughout. Some of those were trying to uh, get elected to sit in on the council, but many of them have actually got their uh, ideas through, and as I said, all the way through to the document. Uh, next one. This one I've already covered, so we can skip ahead. Yes, uh, I, I think one of the crucial things that helped uh, our, our work here is that I, I think maybe half of the delegates, maybe 10 to 15 of them have been really active on the social media channels. We even started using Google Plus to, to have an open conversation with the, the nation. You can see some of them really active on our Facebook page as well as in all the comments and everywhere. And I think this has been the, the best received uh, change for the, for the public when, when they're discussing uh, some of these matters or posting their formal letters. There's always someone within the council, one of the delegates that, that is ready to step in and have that conversation and take that into the, the work that we're doing here. Or if they don't do it, uh, then we do it. Yes. Uh, next one, I think we're just about done. Uh, so what we did uh, prior to going live with all of these open channels and, and going all in on the social media, we, we created community guidelines, something that you voluntarily uh, agree on when you start discussing our, our matters. And I believe this has helped us a lot in, you know, in the very few cases, I would say there are uh, less than 10 occasions where we have had to uh, edit out comments or contact some people that, that went against our community guidelines. It would be interesting to translate and share with you. These are just five simple rules, no harassment, no bad language. Very uh, factual. Yeah. And 
it means that in a few occasions people have uh, gone out of a line, we can go to that document and get the conversation back in order. And we have been monitoring all of the conversations, me and Berke just, uh, we, we monitor this uh, almost day and night, so uh, th that has been the main of the work. But it's, it's just the two of us that have done all of this during the last four months, so it, it's not that uh, staff happy either. Yeah, this is this is basically what we wanted to get across, and I don't, I'm not sure if you are open for questions or how that's organized. Thank you very much. Um, I have a few questions actually on my screen right now, and I'm, I'm going to try and um, go, go through the easier ones quicker. The first one I want to address is actually to uh, Mohammed Hassan, and it's from um, Arafat, and his question really is about you know. Well, he's, he's totally impressed with what you've accomplished across the Middle East and North Africa. His question is, uh, when will Al Jazeera be able to provide some of that sort of um, freedom of expression in countries like Uganda, Zimbabwe, Swaziland, and other parts of Africa? So if you want to quickly, yeah. because that, that's an easy one to deal with. Yeah, yeah, we were actually... Uh, we we're currently looking uh, to uh, roll out a program. Uh, we've been testing the pilot of the program in the Middle East just because uh, the role in the Middle East is much easier. But we can't be looking to expand this uh, in other areas, looking specifically at uh, South America and Africa because uh, we do, do have a lot of challenges and problems that do exist. I think when it comes to uh, okay. issues of protest okay, revolution, to... it's easier to view what's happening. It's easier to see the protest. Uh, if you look at the drought in uh, the Horn of Africa and uh, the large influx of refugees, uh, there isn't as uh, beautiful, or, pardon my use of the word, sexy images coming out of it. How do you portray a protracted crisis? How do you get a message across? But I think getting those marginalized voices in those areas is something we're indeed looking at, and we're hoping to at least launch uh, some of these initiatives later in the year. Uh, thank you. Mohammed, uh, the uh, an interesting question from Christiana, uh, which is, and, and this is really uh, to the group as a whole, which is, what are the roles that that organized civil society can play vis-a-vis uh, -vis these new media platforms, and how do we facilitate uh, the informal online activism? Uh, does anyone want to sort of volunteer to answer that question? Okay. But while it, if I could just think, yeah. thinking, thinking about that, if I can, if I can. I'm just participating in the webinar. Hello. Uh, while, while, while you're thinking about that, Christiana, do you want to ask your question? I'm sorry, who is it that's... Sorry, Ingrid, it's Regina that would like to ask her question. Yes. So I've just, Regina, or I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, I've just unmuted you, Great. so you should be able to ask your question. Hello, can you hear me? No. Hello? Can I'm you hear me? You. I'm hearing yes. you from, here from Iceland. <laughs> uh, thank you. Actually, <laughs> it's not the question. Yes, we can hear you. It will be the short intervention from the VC Secretariat International Telecommunication Union. We would like to draw your attention as well to the VC stock taking process that we have, and we have the online platform. And basically, our platform is structured to uh, 11 VC section lines. And we have uh, we had as well some challenges to create the community building to encourage the discussion. So for us, it will be important to know how actually you build your community uh, strategy, how you build this engagement strategy to attract a lot of uh, users platforms. This question will go to uh, World Bank, Al Jazeera, and as well to Iceland Constitution Council, if it's possible. Thank you. Should we start here in Iceland? Please, go ahead. Okay. Uh, of course, <coughs> we used all the social media, and as Finner said, there is a, lo a large percent of Icelanders that are on Facebook. So that was very easy to get people involved in, in this process by using Facebook. 
uh, we also used other social medias and Icelanders uh, are using uh, our, our very technical uh, nation here so that was easy to get people involved uh, by by uh, social media we also used uh, of course uh, much of press release uh, many press release every week we, we, to the public to the media and so on Finland? yes and, and also a part when we started out doing this we we, thought we we had a clear strategy and we discussed this with with all of the delegates and we set basic ground rules we decided to answer everything and not leave a single comment unanswered which really helped with the engagement and the conversation on our, our site uh, we also had basic guidelines on if, if there were uh, serious incidents where people were you know breaking our community guidelines uh, that should be uh, escalated to me or, or but the, the main strategy was just we, we trust all of the delegates to give answers and we always participate in the conversation and this was a, a big change for a government agency in Iceland. Yeah. Is that, 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 that enough? Yes, thank you very much. Yeah. Would you like to ask it now? Um, I think we have another question Hi. from from Valentina. Uh, yeah, from you can go ahead. Uh, first of all, thanks for this uh, interesting presentation. I hope that we can have them uh, downloadable. Uh, my question is, uh, how much cost uh, one the platform that you described? And uh, I can see that civil society lack uh, knowledge on ICTs and ICT, IT professional become really uh, an asset, a human capital, how to involve them in the, the, our current uh, challenge. Uh, how, how do you experience IT professional, how do you involve them in, uh, in a civil society, in a social change? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, well, our uh, experience from all this uh, has been very good, and we asked about the cost. Uh, uh, we have tried to uh, have uh, to, to have have the cost as low as possible. Finn, can maybe describe that better for you? Yes, we mm -hmm. we we are using a, a content management system, which is basically the largest uh, cost. Uh, factors and, and the live streaming bit, but for all of the other things we used, as I said, we, we try to find solutions that are freely available and uh, as you see, we, we not try to invent the wheel in using video clips uh, or photos or just going on the street, we just use open freely available sources. There was uh, an estimate floating around how, how much this would cost technically, at the moment we're just at the half uh, half of that cost because we took this approach. And uh, 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 for an example, uh, I do all the YouTube YouTube tapes. Uh, uh, I do all the uh, news. Uh, I write on Facebook. I could take every pictures that are on Flickr page. So uh, we are doing this very much uh, ourselves. And uh, we, uh, uh, me as a press officer. I had to have uh, had to learn about this uh, technique, so I have been able to do very much of these technical matters myself, both uh, doing, uh, as I said, did the YouTube tapes, uh, the the pictures, the news, and put it uh, myself on the internet. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm going to ask Mohammed if you can to try and respond to the question that we. We got from Christiana, which really was, how do you see the collective mass of civil society, uh, or what role do you see for them vis-à-vis uh, -vis the new media platforms and the informal online activists? Uh, I think it's important for civil society to, to note that, on the one hand, facilitating the discussion is important, uh, but on the other hand, we should look at what are the discussions that are taking place. I think. Um, 
a short while ago, we were dependent on media organizations to tell us about what's happening in the world around us. Uh, we were cut off with information and communication. And social media really bridges this skip, uh, this skips brilliantly. Uh, we've reached a point where we're seeing a huge numbers of growth on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, Google Plus was formed, like you know, not very long ago, but the amount of millions of users they already have is something that's quite phenomenal. So civil society need to look at these popular platforms, look what discussions are taking place, and see how you can get uh, more civic engagement from ordinary people. Um, what you find is online activism is really, uh, it's talk, and it doesn't really relate to anything. The key thing for civil society should be, how do you transform that talk into tangible actions? How do you create platforms? How do you create uh, opportunities or areas of involvement where people can filter in through and get involved with? Thanks, Mohamed. Um, I actually have a question myself, which is across the three presentations, uh, Mohamed, you mentioned, you said nobody owns this, this discussion. And then, Soren, you presented to us data in, you know, essentially, I'm guessing, data that the World Bank decided was going to be presented in a particular form. And then uh, from Iceland, again, you know, the choice of channels, the choice of, 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 of response mechanisms. Uh, is it true that, that nobody owns this discussion, or is it in fact, um, does the discussion in fact get filtered and controlled by those that own the platforms? No. Uh, we, we haven't, uh, you know, basically we, we are under their uh, uh, ruling, if, if, you, if you know what I mean. When we, when we close up here next month, we're going to export all of our content, all of the comments uh, from the Facebook platform, and we're going to print it in a book that is going to be stored in the libraries for years to come. We need to also store all the video and all of the things, so, so we keep all of the backup on, on our site. And we are also actually using an open source technology to, to save and store uh, the, the conversations on Twitter and Facebook to keep it in a database on our site that we're going to keep through the centuries. So this, this is one of the the thoughts we, we went through before we went all in on social media. I mean, who owns the content and will it stay with us for the next 50 years when people start thinking about how we reviewed the Constitution back in, in 2011? I Thank think, you. Yeah, Bjorn, if I, can, if I can frame that question to you differently, which is, you know, how do you ensure that this information, this, this almost mammoth quantity of information that the bank is putting out is available in the form uh, that's relevant to our communities and to civil society? Okay. So, maybe to answer your first question, like the objective is actually to make uh, this whole process more inclusive. So, and then to open up the conversation so, for instance, because um, I worked uh, for the last 10 years with civil society actors, and one thing which we have a lot is, you know, when you want to empower civil society actors and local communities to participate in development, a key role is playing information. Access to information is uh, almost the precondition and able to participate in any dialogue. And so in the past, what, uh, what personally I have seen a lot happening is that when we have our uh, policy dialogues, there, there are almost similar actors participating in those dialogues uh, all the time. And so now if we make this information much more openly available, bring this data out and better learn to listen to a wide variety of actors, then this can make uh, hopefully development more inclusive. And um, um, I can give you a concrete example. So there was uh, years ago the UN summit on human rights and discrimination against, and, uh, against discrimination. So we worked together with Rigoberta Menchu and her foundation. So in this summit in South Africa, there were five indigenous peoples who represented the voices of indigenous peoples at that UN summit. So what we have basically done is that we have uh, 
sponsored a global video conference connecting 12 countries and in each country we had 40, well, between 30 and 40 uh, local grassroots representatives. So suddenly the whole conversation came from five people representing indigenous peoples to enable 300 people to make their voices heard in able to technology. So that, that I think could be the power of it. And then second, on how to make that relevant and uh, to local people's needs, that's basically, um, yeah, that's a, I, I think that's a big challenge. But uh, I'm, we are convinced that the social media, and I mean, something has happened in the last uh, five to ten years. You know, now these technologies are much easier to be used. They're much more used by particularly young people around the world. And uh, these visualizations and some of the maps I've shown, this is exactly the idea to get this more technocratic knowledge uh, out of these documents and get them into formats where people can interact and comment on. And um, this, I think, big contribution that Hans Rosling has done with this gap minder tool, which also is very similar, visualizing making statistics and data uh, and our programs. So the first question is what the World Bank and other donors are doing. Much more accessible to a very broad audience and not to the traditional actors we interact. Not only to the traditional actors we, we already are interacting. I'm sorry to interrupt here from Iceland, but we are, as we said, we are currently broadcasting our 17th meetings and there are, the media is here. Uh, banking on our door and uh, there's so much to do so um, if you don't have any more questions for Iceland uh, would it be okay if we leave this uh, conference uh, now? Thank you very much Bell Gilder. Uh, all the best with this. It sounds like an absolutely fascinating initiative. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for the chance to be uh, with you. Bye bye. <laughs> Um, I, I, um, Mohammed Hassan, I, I wanted to check with you. I, I, I thought you had something to say on the question of, you know, who owns the discussion. I think if you're looking at discussions on social media platforms, uh, nobody really owns the discussion. Uh, granted, if you look at some of the privacy in terms of use with Facebook, a lot of the content that we upload it. Uh, we're basically giving the platform the right to use the content as they like and to some extent we are ceding ownership. Uh, and if you look at Creative Commons, Creative Commons is quite a great initiative whereby you can share, whereby you can share any sort of content, whether it's um, uh, something that you designed, photographs, content that you've written, uh, videos, and you can share it under specific licenses. Uh, the license could be that it can be used by anyone as long as you attribute to it and sometimes you allowed to use it with attribution or admission, uh, but not for commercial use. And if it is for commercial use, to contact the, the creator of uh, that content and just let them know and financial remuneration then takes place. But I think as, as the role of the internet is evolving and is becoming so intertwined with our lives and how we are using these different platforms, Creative Commons is a great way about uh, that can be used uh, to utilize this sharing of information. Um, if you're looking at uh, open software, you have tons of uh, software that, that exists that's open source. Anybody can share and contribute to this great knowledge that's already taking place. Um, under Creative Commons with Al Jazeera, a lot of the content that we produce, a lot of the videos uh, go on into the Al Jazeera Creative Commons repository. And uh, aspiring filmmakers, any anyone for that matter, can go and use the video, uh, attribute the license to Al Jazeera, just mention that they basically got it from there and create their own videos, put it up on YouTube, on Facebook. So it's basically giving a uh, power of the media or giving uh, this uh, ability to uh, the normal individuals. Um, if we look at Facebook and Twitter, I don't think that they have um, blocked information. Uh, if there are discussions taking place in vulgarity or uh, prejudice takes place, uh, administrators of pages or individuals can report it. But I think for the large part, these platforms have stayed uh, and open, and, and that's a huge disadvantage for the global community. Thanks, Mohammed. 
Uh, I, I know we have about 13 or 14 minutes left, so I'm, I'm uh, inviting my colleague Ned Sarnet, who is Director of Policy and Research at Civicus, to give us some idea of, of how what Civicus has been doing up to now and how we see Civicus taking this forward in the next uh, weeks and months. Ned Sarnet, all yours. Thank you, Ingrid. It's been a fascinating uh, presentation so far. Um, my, I was planning to intervene in the middle, but I thought it's better to leave uh, the space for participants to, to continue ask questions. Just to briefly highlight some of the ongoing work within Civicus, um, we we just recently completed um, our uh, our participatory research exercise that we use to measure the state of civil society and citizens' participation nationally in, in over 35 countries. Uh, this range from Latin America to Europe, uh, the MENA region, Sub-Saharan Africa, Central Asia, etc. And through you know through different form of surveys, focus group discussions, workshops, and case studies, and etc. Uh, this exercise has really generated massive data from over 30,000 uh, citizens, 4,000 CSOs, over 1,000 uh, experts. And the key findings are telling us uh, nothing new, but really affirmation of what has been discussed here now in this webinar. Uh, we're looking at a stage, we're looking at a stage where CSOs seem to be facing multiple challenges. Uh, you know, ranging from volatile and challenging external environment, uh, limited and uh, still ten tension relationships with governments, worsening financial and human resources, low level of public trust on civil society organizations, and in fact even lower levels of public interest and involvement in organized form of civil society organizations. So this is really uh, what seems to be telling us. And but but on the other hand. Uh, an active and healthier and growing culture of citizens' participation seems to be evident everywhere. So this, this sort of informal citizens' participation seem to be growing uh, from the last phase which we observed. It. So this implies for us, and I think it should be a question for all of us to reflect, uh, that the, the lens in which we measure citizens' participation uh, seems to be misguided so far. Uh, we seem to be focused so far more on organized forms of civil society participation and hence we tend to understand that citizens engagement is really should be viewed through this lens as well. That's how uh, donors, that's how we even civil society have been engaging so far. This is exactly what's happening now in the MENA region and also what's evidently clear from our findings is really telling us to question the lens in which we view civil society and citizen participation. We, we do believe that uh, if, if, if at all our experience and what's happening in the MENA region, region is telling us is the fact that in fact citizens are bypassing organized form of civil society organizations to mobilize themselves, to share knowledge, to effect change, and etc. Uh, statistical findings from the MENA region tells us that that region happens to be the lowest in terms of rate of membership in CSOs, lowest in voluntary participation of citizens in civil society organizations. And if we were to stick to, the, to this notion of viewing citizens' participation through the lens of organizations, in fact, what has happened in the MENA region shouldn't have happened, actually. So we are now at this stage where we, we believe that we need to radically shift the way we view citizens' participation and engagement, the way we understand our own role, and, and we need to really move forward in bridging this gap between organized form of civil society and, and this sort of loosely um, disorganized citizens' activism all over the world. And indeed, ICT and technology really provide that, uh, that space at this point in time. What the whole purpose of this dialogue, this discussion essentially was to, to seek from you views and ideas about how we can go on about in uh, scaling up this discussion more broadly, and secondly, how we can actually 
uh, come up with new ideas and new ways of coordination to ensure that uh, we bridge this gap between formal organizations from the civil society and, and the informal ones. This is just the first of this consultation. We hope that policy recommendations and ideas generated out of this dialogue will further feed into the, the next round of discussions happening at our World Assembly in Montreal in September. We, we do hope that uh, we'll be feeding some of the discussion into that. But after that, we, we really hope to, to maintain a community where we can exchange these views and ideas uh, as we go along. Uh, key questions we want to seek from you, uh, key ideas we want to seek from you is really what is there left to be done in terms of bridging this gap? Uh, where are we? Uh, what are the concrete recommendations that we can take forward from lessons taken by a government like Iceland, uh, by initiatives like the Al Jazeera and the World Banks in terms of guarding ourselves against danger of exclusion, which Ingrid mentioned at the beginning. Um, again, is the, how to, 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 to guard ourselves against this challenge of verification of findings and data we find online, and, and how to make sense and, and make data accessible online as well, and, and really how to make it more effective in, in that line. Um, as at, I guess toward the conclusion, we'll come to the way forward in how we can follow up this discussion. Uh, we'll immediately follow up by sharing all of you uh, the, the very uh, ideas and policy recommendations generated from this. But we'll be keen to hear from you how we can scale up this discussion for further. What what uh, what exactly could be the role of groups like Civicus and organized from civil society organizations in bridging this gap? and thirdly, how to, to scale up this dialogue further and to engage ordinary citizens and online activists and others to be part of this dialogue. Thank you, Ingrid. Thank you, Netsamet. Um, just, just a few sort of words before we wrap up completely. I, I think Netsamet mentioned the, the Civicus World Assembly that's happening in Montreal. Uh, from the 10th to the 12th of September, and I know one of the key um, tracks there is actually going to focus on just this issue. Uh, and we've got a really interesting bunch of, of speakers and participants uh, coming to Montreal. Uh, so anyway, you have, a, well, as many of you that, as can make it would be welcome, but uh, for those of you who can't, we're hoping that we will have much, much more uh, in-depth uh, information on this topic post the World Assembly. Uh, secondly, I think those of you that actually have already put your own uh, papers or policy positions or um, content of any kind on this subject together, uh, we'd be only too happy to, to take a look at it and try and incorporate it into our own background papers that are going out uh, to the World Assembly delegates, but also to Civicus members and partners more widely. Um, is there anyone else that has a question at this point? Because otherwise, I'm going to wrap this up by just thanking all our panelists and thanking all of you for participating despite the uh, technological hang-ups. No. So then one last word. I know a man that couldn't join us, but um, no. we will have her presentation circulated to all of you as well. There's somebody trying to speak. Who is it? Hello, hello. This is Go ahead. This one. I just thought that one thought would be to facilitate this exchange between CSOs and then the mm -hmm. and the ICT activists because these are we, in our work we've seen in many countries there are two communities and they don't know each other very well and in order to have more sustained social change you would have to I think it would be very interesting to bring those two communities together that's certainly that's certainly a very useful tangible step that we can we can promote thanks Soren um, mm -hmm. 
Thank you, everybody. It's been absolutely fascinating. I can't imagine, you know, we've actually seen a government, a large international institution, and a significant international media player uh, come at this from three very, very different directions. Uh, I know I've, I've, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure many of you have as well. Please feel free to, to contact us via email or any other way you want to if you have any further questions, suggestions, or input on this topic. Uh, but for now, let's leave it here. Thank you all. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you so much.